Good morning. Um, today we're continuing our uh, week of history of music and films. Uh, today's focus is going to be the advent of theme songs. So when we're talking about a theme song, I'm not talking necessarily about the soundtrack, but I'm talking about um, a song that is written specifically for a movie that is also played on the radio or um, became popular at the same time as the movie. So we're looking at um, pop music, not necessarily classical music for this lecture. So um, types of film music. There are two types of film music, diegetic. Diegetic is a sound whose source is visible on the screen or whose source is implied to be present by the action of the film. So diegetic sound is any sound presented as originating from a source within the film's world. So my character um, has the music with her instead of it being played in the background and my character not knowing that is there at all. Diegetic sound can be either on screen or off screen, depending on whatever its source is within the frame or outside the frame. Examples of diegetic sound are the voices of characters, sounds made by objects in the story, music represented as coming from instruments in the story space. So if my character is playing a guitar, that music is going to be diegetic. If my characters go to a dance, any music that's played by the DJ at the dance is going to be diegetic because my characters can hear it. If my characters can't hear it, it's non-diegetic. So non-diegetic music is sound whose source is neither visible on the screen nor has been implied to be present in the action. Non-diegetic music comes from a source outside of the story. Examples are narrator's commentary, sound effects which are added for the dramatic effect, incidental music, or mood music. So tomorrow we're going to talk more about incidental music, um, but today we're focused on theme songs, which can be both diegetic or non-diegetic. So popular music has been used in film accompaniment from the beginning. By the 1920s, studios began promoting songs written expressly for their films, known as theme songs, through sheet music and record sales. Popular songs appeared in sound film as well. Sometimes they were performed on screen, as by Dooley Wilson. He sings As Time Goes By in Casablanca, and sometimes um, the pop songs were heard emanating from on-screen nightclubs or radios. So um, if I was the director of a film and there was a really popular song at the time, I might try to work it into my movie so that I can use that song um, and relate it to my movie. Both of these examples, um, Dooley Wilson singing and um, music from nightclubs or radios are diegetic music because they are occurring in the film itself. We can see Dooley Wilson sing um, and we can see the characters dancing at the nightclub. The large scale promotion of theme songs was a product of the 1950s and the phenomenal success of Tex Ritter's Do Not Forsake Me from High Noon in 1952. So um, it was happening before 1952, but that success that Tex Ritter had and that the film High Noon had from having both a song and the film together, um, that success is what pushed the theme song even further. Theme songs were everywhere, now heard in films complete with their lyrics, cross-promoted on radio, television, and on record, and generating huge revenue for the studios. The popularity of soundtracks dates from this era, although there are some interesting earlier examples, such as Disney's Snow White. Often composed in advance of the score, theme songs had determining influence on both the shape and sound of Hollywood films in the 1950s and 1960s.
Um, Mancini created many of the most memorable songs of the era, such as Moon River from Breakfast at Tiffany's. Um, you would know Mancini because he composed um, The Pink Panther. Yet Mancini never defined himself as a songwriter. He considered song melodies as motifs to be exploited in the scoring process. So he would write a motif, um, a little short melody or a theme, and then he would use it in the score, not just in the song, the theme song. So Moon River is an example of diegetic music in film. So we're gonna watch this little clip. So you can hear how that would be used on the radio and could be um, promoting the movie in, in another way, not just with the movie itself. In the 1960s, new scoring possibilities produced a hybrid of the theme score and rock and roll, which is called the compilation score. Compiled scores consist of a collection of exi existing songs, often used in their original recorded format and largely derived from non-cinematic sources, usually popular music, but also opera and classical music. These can be supplemented by original songs and orchestral background scoring. The compilation score has brought cinema full circle, harking back to the days of silent cinema when accompanists would select music from a variety of sources, including popular song. The compilation score for Quentin Tarantino's Kill Bill Volume 1, for example, contains Nancy Sinatra's cover of Sonny and Cher's Bang Bang and songs by Isaac Hayes, Tamasu Hotai, Charlie Feathers, Al Herc, Miko Kaji, and a cue from Herman's score for Twisted Nerve in 1968. So you can see um, all the different music that was used in Kill Bill Volume 1. Other notable compilation scores feature various kinds of popular music, rock and roll, such as Easy Rider in 1969, and Eclectic Mixes, Apocalypse Now in 1979, which includes Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries and the Rolling Stones' I Can't Get No Satisfaction. Film director Quentin Tarantino also cleverly uses soundtracks to create his movies, according to Open Culture. Tarantino reportedly relies on music to help him flesh out his movie ideas. He says, One of the things I do when I am starting a movie, when I'm writing a movie, or when I have an idea for a film is, I go through my record collection and just start playing songs, trying to find the personality of the movie, find the spirit of the movie. Then boom, eventually I'll hit one, two, or three songs, or one song in particular. Oh, this will be a great opening credit song. 
For these directors, music plays an integral part in the overall feel and power of the film. It takes the role of a plot device, moving the action and fusing perfectly with on-screen movement and dialogue. A great theme song can really make a film commercially popular and memorable. Many of the greatest film soundtracks are also best-selling albums, placing number one in charts around the world. In 2013, prior to the hotly anticipated The Great Gatsby soundtrack, U.S. Billboard charts ranked the most successful soundtracks, with many albums spending a staggering amount of weeks at number one. Saturday Night Fever from 1978 spent a whopping 24 weeks at number one. By releasing a soundtrack, the audience can own a piece of the film before it is released on DVD or VHS back in the day and be able to listen to music over and over again, remembering their favorite part of the film. The particularly moving My Heart Will Go On song by Celine Dion for Titanic became a sensational hit selling more than 15 million copies in the U.S., as well as winning four Grammys and an Oscar. I had that soundtrack. With the best-selling theme song, hype is created for a film, and audiences can take away a part of the film with them out of the cinema. 